Hello and welcome to this edition of Coast and Country powered by the science of the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Coming up in this special edition all about aquatic invasive species. We talked to Summer Stebbins about the different types of survey work that the Office of Aquatic Invasive Species undertake each year. Riley Doherty talks about how they share their survey data not only for the public but for a wider audience. And Dr. Jeremiah Foley, assistant scientist, talks about the problem Connecticut now has dealing with hydrilla. But first, what exactly is the Office of Aquatic Invasive Species at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station? Well, until recently, it didn't actually exist, but now it has been formally put together. And I sat down with Greg Bugby, the lead of the office, to find out more. The Office of Aquatic Invasive Species was formed by the Connecticut State Legislature in 2022. And it's an extension of work that's been done for decades here at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station on lakes and ponds and rivers. Um, our work goes well back into the 80s and actually the 70s where we were primarily looking at pollution of lakes, uh, algal blooms and that sort of thing, pollution of rivers. And in the uh, early 2000s, everything began to shift to more to the aquatic weed problems that are occurring in uh, the state. And most of these weeds that are in our lakes and ponds are not native or invasive. So um, in the early 2000s, what was formed was what's called the Invasive Aquatic Plant Program, which I led to 2022 when the uh, legislature felt it was important to sort of formalize the work and create what's called the Office of Aquatic Invasive Species. And the purpose of this office was to uh, document, further document um, the invasive aquatic weed problems in the state's water bodies um, and rivers um, and, and, and look for solutions research-wise, uh, find solutions to, the, to these problems, um, disseminate this information to the public, work very closely with the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, which has a big role when it comes to regulating what goes on and all other, a lot of other facets of our water bodies. So the Office of Aquatic Invasive Species really uh, was brought forth to formalize this work, um, make sure that it was funded um, consistently, which prior to that, we just didn't know where our funding was coming from. Uh, it was um, really spearheaded by um, uh, Representative Christine Palm, and uh, she has to be given a lot of credit for bringing this into uh, uh, being. So right now, um, this office is now established. We have been able to hire three people, um, uh, two technicians uh, and a scientist. You know, we are off and running, and we've now got about a year under our belt. It took us a little time to hire these people, um, but now we are fully up and running. We began doing what's called surveys in the 2000s with our Invasive Aquatic Plant Program. Prior to that, it really wasn't known, you know, how many invasive species we had, where they were, what percentage of lakes and ponds had them, what sort of damage they were doing, other than sort of people saying, my lake is full of weeds, you know, I can't swim there anymore. So we started this in the 2000s. We've done close to 400 surveys of, of the lakes, ponds, and rivers in the state. And, um, uh, and we found that about two-thirds have one or more invasive species, which is extremely high for a state. Uh, the northern New England states have only a few, and, and their percentage of infestations are very small. So Connecticut, from a standpoint of New England, is kind of the, in my mind, the gateway of these species, particularly as the weather is warming, which our winters aren't as severe as they once were, and we're finding southern species are moving northward. So this is a concern. And one of the concerns that really, I think, brought the invasive species issue on the aquatic side into focus with this new strain of plant we discovered it's called hydrilla, new strain of hydrilla in the Connecticut River and uh, creating havoc there. And uh, 
we were able to do the survey of the river and showed that the entire Connecticut River was infested with this plant with huge potential impacts on not only people boating and swimming and that sort of thing, but uh, everything from marinas to ecosystems that are being changed drastically with as this plant uh, basically takes over the river. So, um, you know, that, that really got us going. So we are continuing our surveys now. We are working uh, on the Connecticut River. We got uh, our new scientist is one of his major uh, tasks is to look into this hydrilla issue into the river. We have uh, a lot of partners now we work it with, including, as I mentioned, the Connecticut DEP. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is working very closely with us on the river system since it is a navigable waterway. Um, and towns, uh, lake associations, they all ask for help. And when they ask for help, we try, if they don't, they have not had a survey, we try to get out there and do a survey, uh, assess what plants are there and how best those lakes can be managed. We have about four different kinds of lake surveys that we do. Our most general is our full vegetation survey. So this is when we go out to a lake, a river, a pond, and we identify all of the native vegetation that's present in the lake as well as any invasive. So we identify it to the species level. Each plant we find, we will take a sample, collect it, and um, mount it, and put it in our both our physical and um, digital herbarium. And then each plant has a unique shape file and we will map its locations on our tablet and create a full profile of all the vegetation in the lake. And then we take some transect data, which are we collect sediment type, plant abundance, and um, depth of the water. And we'll go back to those points each year we do the, the lake surveys. That way we have a record over time. And then we do a water sample from the deepest point of the lake. We do temperature and dissolved oxygen profiles. And then we also collect samples for at the surface and the bottom, take that back to the lab, analyze it for pH, conductivity, alkalinity, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And then that's sort of our full vegetation survey. Now, some of the lakes we go to are really, really large, so we just don't have the capacity to do that in depth of a survey. So for instance, the Connecticut River has a huge hydrilla infestation, so we will go out and just map the invasive plants. So we won't do the natives as much, except for on our transect points. What we do is we have our GPS tracking our boat path and we navigate around these large patches and that way it gives us really accurate acreage information because you need to know the acreage of the plants in order to manage them properly. And then some specific treatment based, so if someone's doing an herbicide treatment or any other kind of management, we'll do a pre and post treatment survey. So we'll go out before the management at the beginning of the season, then we'll come back at the end of the season, see how things have changed, see how the treatment went and um, we will also look for any state listed species that might be required so um, for instance biden's vecchia is a protected species for the state of connecticut so we will go out in june at a lake where it's known to be present and we'll map out all of its locations so it can be protected um, during any treatments that might occur so there are a lot of lakes we've surveyed uh, probably close to 250 lakes throughout the state um, and basically a lake association, a concerned citizen, a town, or even, you know, the state department like energy and environmental protection, they will call us with a concern. They'll say, you know, our lake is full of plants, or we notice this really weird looking plant and we don't really know what it is. So we'll add it to our survey list. And that's essentially how it goes. So people, um, to call up and request a survey and we add it to the list. We also have a list of maybe 20 to 30 lakes that we'll do every five years or so and that will allow us to track the change over time for the whole state of Connecticut to see you know if the climate's warming if things are changing if water chemistry is changing um, just to sort of have that long-term uh, data trend here is a Microsoft Surface but an Android tablet or any kind of tablet that has the capacity to handle our Esri software will work um, but so we have our Microsoft Surface tablet and then we have our uh, GNSS system. So this will give us, um, this connects to satellites, gives us our GPS location. So on the tablet, right now I have sort of a mock demo because we're just in the greenhouse. We're not actually on a lake, but I have some plant species here. And essentially while we're on the lake, the GPS is giving us our precise location. 
and say I find a plant, I can just click on the species and draw exactly where it is and then go on to the next species and map um, all of the plants in the lake, including um, some wetland species. So Phragmites is an invasive wetland, so I can draw it just sort of along the shoreline um, of a water body. And we used to use colored pencils on paper to do this. And as of 2018, we moved to the tablet and it has made our work so much more efficient, so much more accurate. And we're really able to give a full comprehensive survey map uh, to the citizens that request it. So when we come back from aquatic vegetation surveys out in the field, we bring back one sample of each plant species we find. Um, and it's important to keep track of this data and have that sample um, for the future to look back on. So we take that sample, we press it, we dry it, and we mount it on special herbarium paper. Um, and that is put into our herbarium. Each herbarium mount has a ID number similar to a library. Um, it's a library of plants. Um, and each label also has the information on where that plant was found and what conditions it was found under. Each of those mounts are then scanned and put onto our online herbarium on our website for the public to view. We use top-of-the-line GIS software to collect, manage, analyze, and visualize our data. So when we come back from the field, we post-process all of the data we collected. And in the fall and winter months, we analyze this data, we edit it, and we prepare it for visualization or maps. We use this data to track changes in the plant community over time. Um, all of our data is then put onto our website, put into reports, put onto our website, um, for the public to view and access at any point. The Interactive Data Repository is a new project I'm working on. Um, it's also one of our legislative charges to serve as a data repository for all statewide aquatic plant invasive species data. It is an interactive web mapping application that allows users to explore our data and get a general idea of what's going on in the state in terms of invasive aquatic plants. The data repository will also be helpful for lake associations and lake management consultants who need to use our data for lake treatments or other lake management. They use our plant species locations to assist their work. So the new data repository will allow them to download our raw shape files and download the data we've collected. In the winter months, we provide aquatic plant workshops to the public and also presentations on the data we've collected for lake associations, municipalities, or anyone else who requests them. Our aquatic plant workshops train lake associations and other members of the public how to identify invasive aquatic plant species in the field so that if they're at a pond in the state, and they see something funny, they can send us a photo and reach out to us and let us know that they may have seen an invasive species. Um, that way we can get out there that summer and figure out what's going on. I've been involved in invasive aquatic plant research ever since my undergraduate. I worked at the United States Department of Agriculture Invasive Plant Research Lab and Fort Lauderdale and later um, as a postdoc. And this lab is really centered on um, using biological control agents, primarily insects, to help mitigate the um, environmental impacts from exotic invasive plants, particularly aquatic plants. Integrated pest management is really where we're taking um, management tactics. It's rather, rather than relying on any one 
um, tactics, say herbicides or manual removal of aquatic invasive species, we like to use the strengths of each one of those in concert with one another to help mitigate not only the impact, the ecological impact of invasive aquatic species, the economic impact as well. Since getting here and understanding what infrastructure we need, I actually visited the University of Florida Center for Aquatic Invasive Species when I first got here and really learned a lot on their testing infrastructure. You've really got to start small with basic questions in your laboratory, in your environmental chamber, on your bench top then those can really migrate into larger scale experiments, whether it's in a greenhouse or a farm. And from there, you take it to the field and hopefully you can have some proof of concept um, data for some of the uh, experiments that uh, came before. Connecticut is ground zero for this new strain of uh, hydrilla that's in the United States. Hydrillus had a rich introductory history uh, to the United States. The first, there's three strains in the United States. The first one came to Florida in about uh, the 1950s. Then in the 1980s, another strain popped up. And then in 2016, we documented this third genetically distinct strain, now considered a subspecies of hydrilla, which we refer to as clade C hydrilla. This plant has the uh, fundamental ability to change the very thing that Connecticut estuaries and coves have become known for, which is their intact biodiverse tidal fresh salt and brackish water ecosystems. Hydrilla is considered one of the world's worst aquatic weeds. A single plant can produce 191 tips. Each one of those tips grows about an inch a day. So the rate of biomass accumulation is really astonishing. And this is a new strain that has not been researched at all. Uh, and uh, understanding how it grows, when it grows, what we can treat with and how we treat it is really um, on the uh, Office of Invasive Aquatic Species to uh, write the book of knowledge that will be used to help manage the species in the future. So oftentimes people like to grow plants in their aquarium. They oftentimes select plants that are resistant to diseases, easy to grow, resistant to insects, and don't need a lot of nutrients input. So those attributes that make a plant wonderful for an aquarium wreak havoc once they're released. Oftentimes uh, your son, say, has an aquarium and you want to save the plants because you think green is good. You'll take your plants or your goldfish or whatnot and you'll dump it into a lake system. And that's um, it, for sure how the other two strains got, of hydrilla got here and we're pretty sure that's how um, this new strain in the Connecticut River has got here. We first detected hydrilla in 2016. There was great concern that this plant would spread outside of the Connecticut River and affect other water bodies. Um, up until from 2016 to 2023, we have not documented this at all. Yet this year alone, we've now had six reported cases of hydrilla being in other water bodies throughout the state of Connecticut and in Massachusetts. And there's only really one way that's happening, and that's through boat traffic. It's, uh, it's also plausible that waterfowl are transmitting this plant from one body to another, but it's the correlation we see between high active fishing tournaments and fishing sites in relation to where the plant is in these new locations, typically near boat ramps, is pretty indicative that these plants are getting transported through recreational boating. Oftentimes, if you rip the plant up, you can take one plant and when you rip it up, you create three plants. Those plants, if you don't um, properly remove them from the water, they can drift down and start new plants and new populations. This is a big problem because um, as a boater goes through a thick mat of hydrilla, how, it's countless on how many pieces they're fragmenting and cutting up with their prop. Those plants then disperse through uh, natural water movement and start new populations elsewhere. So actually physically removing the plant can cause the population to expand. The Army Corps of Engineers is actually doing a demonstration project over the past uh, two, three years and then into the future on um, demonstrating what herbicides and what management tactics work best for this new strain. Um, so we're working in close conjunction with not only the Army Corps, University of Florida, and Dr. Ben Sperry um, to understand and to demonstrate to the public that management is going to be the way we're going to alleviate the ecologies of these infested areas. So once these species are established and it's much less expensive to prevent them rather than to manage them. Managing aquatic plants is extraordinarily difficult, particularly if you want to rid the 
water body completely of the plant because almost no management gets every last plant or propagule out of there and it requires remanagement at some point. So one of the things we look at is all the different methods of managing and there's a lot of them. Um, everything from hand pulling and harvesting techniques to um, uh, herbicides which are chem spe special chemicals that are um, uh, authorized by the United States EPA and the Connecticut DEP for use and considered safe when used properly. Um, there's um, uh, uh, what's called biocontrols, which would be great if we could somehow find some sort of a biological way, some sort of a, 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 a pathogen or enemy of the invasive that may be established in the native range that can be brought here and not cause other problems, which is we have to worry about, can be established to control these plants. Now, these are few and far between. They're extremely difficult to bring into the uh, United States, make sure they don't harm anything else, and then have them work. The one biocontrol which is currently used in the state is what's called uh, these uh, fish called grass carp, uh, what's called triploid grass carp. They're sterile fish that can be put into lakes and ponds that will eat the vegetation. They have their problems. They've been inserted into Lake Candlewood for Eurasian water milfoil control and they ended up controlling every last plant. So there's nothing left. And this is often what you worry about with biocontrols, keeping them under control so they are not over over uh, grazing or whatever on, on, on native species. We've worked with uh, these bottom blankets, which is like a tarp-like material that you can put on the bottom and kind of smother plants for small areas and they can work. Our research is designed to look at novel techniques, new things, if we can find them. And we're always looking for that. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of management uh, techniques uh, we're looking into all of them, and many times you need to use a combination in order for it to work properly. But the key is to know, and, and this is one of the problems, is people, they say, I got weeds, but they don't know what it is. And, uh, and, 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 you know, and our surveys can not only determine what it is, but also what other native species that maybe need protection are also in that uh, body of water. Educating the public on how to keep these things out of lakes is super important and you know with if public awareness is there these things will not be spreading anywhere near as much as they, they were. That's all from this edition of Coast and Country. If you want to find out more about the work of the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and the Office of Aquatic Invasive Species, then visit the website at ct.gov forward slash CAES and search for Aquatic Invasive Species. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.